Hi, this is Danny Heller from dannyhellerart.com, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Sometimes we hear about architects who later talk with us about their houses, and sometimes we hear about houses, which eventually lead us to the architect. Today's show started as a visit to a very special house in Palm Springs, California, a small, very modernist home that will only get more famous as time goes by. Its architect is Jim Jennings, who joins us from San Francisco. Later on, a few minutes with Frank Harmon, and now the guy who visited that special Palm Springs house, George Smart. Hi, folks. It's not very often that I fall in love with a house. I mean... This is a very special relationship. Whenever I even think of this house, I get a genuine rush or high, and I just can't get it out of my head. The day I saw it, I couldn't eat after it was over. <laughs> it was like it was like my stomach was just rumbling. I could feel the butterflies in it. If that house had a heart rate, I'm sure I would be synchronized right with it. I mean, that's how much of a spell that I was under when I visited a little house in Palm Springs by Jim Jennings. Would you say it was a visceral experience? Oh, absolutely. It's, there should be a Hallmark card <laughs> for this kind of thing that I could send a card. I don't know who I'd send it to, the house or myself. Um, <laughs> but you'd send it. I would send it, yes. Support for U.S. Marnish Radio comes from Marnish Realtor Angela Roll and Nichiha.com slash U.S. Marnist. Beauty, love, durability, designed to last for years to come, bringing you peace and tranquility. You feel relaxed knowing your house can easily achieve any exterior look and any color. Feeling this good. Nichia, 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 Nichia. Say it with me. Nichia. Advanced engineering. Nichia, Nichia. Durability. Textures. Finishes. And colors. Visit Nichia.com slash US modernist. Nichia, Nichia, Nichia. Architect Jim Jennings is 80, but you couldn't tell it from his photos or his portfolio or his voice or the incredible energy that he has when you look at some of his lectures online. Jim grew up in L.A. He graduated in 1966 from UC Berkeley in architecture and founded Jim Jennings Architecture in 1975. From there, he's gone on to create largely off-the-radar homes and buildings that only get more classic as time goes by. His visiting artist house, recipient of the AIA 2006 Institute Honor Award, was named one of the five most influential and inspiring houses of the past decade. He was awarded the 2019 Maybeck Award by AIA California, and he teaches at Berkeley. His partner slash muse, Teresa, is an architectural writer, and there must be a great story there, too. Welcome, Jim. Well, thank you, George. It's so nice to have you. 
You and I have talked before a little bit over email, but to actually dive into your work is just an incredible journey. Well, thank you. Well, let's start off with this little house that I found in Palm Springs. Do you know Trevor O'Donnell? Yes, I do. Well, Trevor is a very renowned tour guide for architecture in Palm Springs. And he took us to a house that you designed, and I believe it was originally for you, right? That's correct. It was uh, one that Therese and I built together. And when did you start working on it? Well, it really began around 2004. We had taken a trip to the desert, and it was familiar territory to me, having grown up in Southern California and graduated high school in Riverside. And even as a small child, we used to take trips out to the desert. I forget what we were celebrating, but she had arranged for us to spend a night at the Lautner Motel in uh, Desert Hot Springs. And there was, it's, uh, there was a remnant of it left. And we drove around and saw a sign on a property, and I wound up buying it. So that's how it started. And was this a piece of property all by itself? Was it in a development? What was it like, that land? Well, it was the north end of town. It was uh, part of an old subdivision. It was in the Racket Club area, and it was vacant two-thirds of an acre. It had never been touched, according to the soils people that I had look at it. So it was a tabula rasa. The thing that was amazing about it, which is what Therese really pointed out to me when we first saw it, was the proximity to the mountain. It's at a basic sea level elevation. It might be a couple hundred feet above sea level at Palm Springs at that end of town. And the mountain is almost 11,000 feet, and it's within a mile. So there's an incredible relationship between the site and the mountain. That was the view. The view was up and out. And because it was undisturbed desert, there was something that was very appealing about it to me. What was your plan of approach for designing this house for you and and Teresa? Because you certainly put together something that is quite unique, I think, for Palm Springs, particularly in its simplicity and its elegance? Well, there are a couple of aspects to it. Uh, One was just to use basic simple materials. It's all concrete and steel, concrete block. There's no wood in the building, which was something that I thought would be very appropriate for the desert so that it would stand up. Wood doesn't do so well there because of the uh, climate. However, the impulse toward the site was really to create a retreat, to create a fortress, to create a completely enclosed environment, self-contained. And that impulse just came from putting something on the site because the site had not been touched. It was still the desert. And rather than creating an approach toward the desert, the attitude would be one of leaving it alone. So there's zero landscaping. There is zero disruption to the site except for where the building sits, and that was the whole idea. It would have a relationship to the desert, and it would have a relationship to the mountain, those two things. And it really is a fortress in a way in that there is this concrete block wall around almost all of it. That's right. I refer to it as my little white fortress with the open heart because uh, it has that relationship to the mountain, to the sky, to the environment surrounding it but not in the typical mid-century modern way. The idea was to connect to the landscape. In this case, it's self-contained. It does connect to the landscape, but it does it in a totally different way. It is a fortress. And it has a pool. It has a long rectangular pool along one of the walls. That's right. And that pool is positioned so that essentially you look over it and look at the mountain in that direction to the west. But it also functions at night in the dark. There are lights, and because it's the breezy end of town, the wind on the water causes an amazing light show on the wall at night. So it's kind of a very kinetic experience as well. Now, this house is not very large. In fact, I think you had to go through some hoops to make a small house, right? We did. 
there is a requirement for a building for a residence to be at least 1,500 square feet in size. This one is 720. Oh, my. And so what was strange is we went all the way through the planning process, through applying for a building permit. It went through the permit process, I should say. It went all the way through to secure a building permit. And they realized that they had not submitted it through planning, and it got thrown back by the planning department saying it was too small. So the planning director at the time was very helpful and said, I cannot approve it, even though I made lots of arguments quoting the building code and all sorts of other things. He didn't buy it. He said, it's never been done before, but I will help you get a variance. So that's the process we went through to get a variance. And what's a variance in planning terms? A variance was, in this case, to allow a building that was smaller than what was required to be built on the site. And the rationale for it was that you can't tell. The building is designed in such a way because the wall that surrounds the courtyard is also the wall of the house. It is seamless in its architectural integrity, and so it looks like a single building. It could be a large house, large enough house. And the actual space inside the wall is close to 3,000 square feet. So in a way, the variance was based on the fact that this small little house looked sitting on its site as if it could have been a much larger house, even though it presents a very inscrutable face to the community it still passed the size test. Was that a very hard sell with the uh, planning commission? No, it was a very interesting process. Once the planning director at the time told me that he would help me get a variance, he told me what the rationale would be. He told me what the reasons would be for the variance. I got writer's cramp writing them all down. (laughs) And then when I applied for the variance, I reiterated what he had told me. And when the planning department recommended approval to the planning commission, they essentially recited from my application in listing their reasons for approval. So in a way, it was a circular kind of enterprise, but he really did help in the logic of it all, and it made sense. The planning commission, during the hearing, Terry was in the audience because she was ready to stand up and say, I'm a, I'm a professional journalist, design journalist, and I disagree with whatever somebody was going to say. And in the hearing, somebody stood up. They asked if anybody wanted to object, and somebody stood up and came to the podium and said, I was really, my wife and I live in the area. We were really, really worried that a tiny little house was going to be built in the neighborhood. But then we went down to City Hall. We looked at the drawings, and we think what is being proposed is really terrific going to be great. And then he sat down. So <laughs> that never that never happened. You were not a pariah. No. No, and, and that never happens. Nobody stands up to speak to yeah. say that they like something. <laughs> never. <laughs> so it was a very, very wonderful surprise at that point. And that got approved. For our listeners who are curious, you can be going to jimjenningsarchitecture.com and look up Desert House and you can see photos of this structure that we've been talking about. Jim, I wanted to ask you just as a background, so why is it that the community wanted a 1,500 square foot house? I would think they would encourage houses of various sizes in a community like Palm Springs. Well, that was then and this is now. I think that smaller houses are gonna be looked at more favorably than they were then. I think it had to do with property values. People thought that if something small was built, then their property would not be worth as much as if larger houses were built. In a sense, it's conventional wisdom, but it's conventional wisdom of a certain era. How many bedrooms does this house have? One. How many do you need? (laughs) (laughs) That's true. I can only sleep in one bed at a time. That's right. It was for us, so it was only one. And the house is almost entirely white? Yes. Everything was painted white, and the reason for that was even though there are different materials, the steel and the concrete block, the only part that's not painted white is the fascia around the edge of the roof, which is a galvanized steel, and it's so the roof will float above the wall. 
one of the approaches to the design was to articulate the elements. And essentially, they are the basic elements of architecture. There's the roof, the wall, and the ground. And each one is separated, visually separated and disconnected from each other. Of course, there's steel beams that the roof has to sit on, so the beams show up on top of the wall. The, the separation of these elements allows glass to span between the supports for the roof so that the mountain, the view of the mountain, is continuous. When you're looking out from inside the house, the view of the mountain is really continuous because you're looking between the roof and the wall, the top of the wall. There's a slot of glass. But that all comes from the articulation, from separation of the basic elements of the building. Now, how many years did you own it? About four years. About four years. I mean, this sounds like Shangri-La to me. So what prompted you to sell? Well, it didn't fit into our life. At the time, I was doing a lot of work down there, other projects down there. And as it turned out, I really used it myself as a personal retreat. When I was down on business, and occasionally I would go down and meet up with a friend, an architect friend from Los Angeles, and uh, another client who became a friend. So it became a personal retreat in a way. Terry grew up in Newport Beach and was not a fan of the desert, the climate, the environment. So it sort of fell to me to <laughs> take advantage of it, which I loved. I loved going down and just being able to be in the space, in the building, and uh, it was wonderful. Let's go back, Jim. So you've been doing this a long time, decades. In 2008, the American Academy of Arts and Letters gave you a big honor with its Academy Award for Architecture. How did you start out, and who were some of the inspiring architects that got you involved in modernism? Well, how I started out was as an engineering student at UC Berkeley in the 1950s, the late 50s, and I discovered architecture there. I referred to myself as an accidental architect. I was studying engineering and living on the north side of campus, walking past the old architecture building, which is now the journalism school, every day. And in the springtime of my freshman year, I saw a group of students sitting outside, and they were doing an exercise, talking. They had a model. It was a classic exercise of how to support a brick using sticks and glue and thread. And it was a structure exercise, but it was uh, essentially an intuitive design exercise. After the competition of who could support the brick or how your little construction would support the brick, they were weighed and the lightest one was declared the winner. Anyway, I was watching this little discussion of students and the exercise, and it just looked fascinating. So I walked into the building. I got into the habit of walking in and looking around and seeing what was going on, because all of the projects that were noteworthy were put up on the wall for display. One day, I was in the old art building, and somebody came out, a professor came out. He was right out of central casting. And he... I mean, like he had a mortar board and a diploma in his hand? Or was it a black turtleneck and a tweed jacket? Right, and a beret. Well, these were the old days. He was about 5'3". He had snow white hair, a bow tie, as I remember, a bow uh -huh. tie and uh, suspenders. And he said, may I help you? Like I was some kind of a, you know, an interloper. Like, what are you doing here? He chatted me up a bit and found out I was an engineering student, and I was fascinated. And he said, if you want to change your major, I'll help you do it. And so that's how it happened. And how did you get attached to modernism as a segment of design to follow? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, I really don't know. I suppose it was maybe partly my education, but not really. I am a son of California, but I'm a child of wartime LA. and as a small child, there were some things that I saw that really, I realized much later, stuck in my head. The Griffith Observatory, the Hollywood Bowl, 
when I was in preschool and kindergarten, we were attending a school across from the Hollywood Bowl. And I remember my grandmother was an RN. I went as a toddler to visit her office, her doctor's office, which it turned out was in the Bradbury building. And I just, all oh, I yes. remembered was, sure. the, all I remembered was the elevator in that space. So I think that these things were not obvious, but they get embedded in our consciousness. I could think of living in Redlands in the orange groves. And there's a kind of what I would have called the geometry of agriculture. And all of these things are influences on me. And as far as modernism, I think it's the logic, the, uh, the internal logic, the purity of an idea being expressed. There are just aspects to it that I think I just gravitate toward. Tell me about the geometry of agriculture. Well, I think in a way it's the straight lines. I'm thinking of not just the orange grove of my youth, but within the order, within the rigidity, is the flourishing of life. So in a way, it's not a limiting thing. Uh, it's essentially the use of geometry, the use of a certain level of rigidity in order to allow for life to flourish, to allow for beauty to flourish. Uh -huh. And I guess that on a, a very simplistic basis, the geometry of agriculture is what you see out the airplane window. That's true. When you're flying over the fields. That's, uh, that's always been fascinating to me is to look at how these fields are designed and how they put the pieces of property together. I think it's all part of the same thing. Absolutely. And what architects inspired you when you started to move on from agricultural forms into studying architecture in school? Were you a fan of Wright or what was some of the later kinds of works like Neutra, for instance? The, one, the, the architects that influenced me when I was in school were the usual suspects. It was Frank Lloyd Wright, it was Meese, it was Kahn, it was others. But it came to me that there were aspects of each that I adopted as an attitude. So with Wright, for example, there was a level of experimentation. Years later, I decided I needed a conference room for a little office I was renting in Oakland. And I knew a fabricator who had worked on another project of mine, and I designed a demountable aluminum conference room, a big cylinder, an 11-foot diameter cylinder with a table, and it was all made out of sheets of aluminum and a frame, and, and it bolted together. And it took years for me to get this thing built. In the meantime, the fabricator went out of business, but he swore to me he would finish, and eventually he did. So I only refer to that in thinking about Frank Lloyd Wright's constant experimentation. I decided that it was unfair of me to ask my clients to experiment unless I was willing to experiment on myself. So that's where that project came from. And that was around 1991, I think, because your futuristic conference room got a lot of press. Yes, it was 1991. The design of it started probably four or five years earlier. It took a long time to get it fabricated and get it finished. But you're right. Did you have a client for this conference room? He was the client. Me. Oh. It was okay. his, his conference room. Oh, <laughs> yeah. you're going to use it. I got it. Yeah, this was for me. I was experimenting on myself. Well, as long as surgeons don't do that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So well, that would take a mirror. In this case, all I needed was a fabricator. Was it a satisfying experience to use your conference room once it was constructed? It was very interesting. I have a client who used to joke about his pencil falling in the middle of the conference table, which was made out of two aluminum channels that came out from one side of the thing. So there was a gap, and uh, he joked about his making sure his pencil didn't fall through the crack and land on the floor. So, yeah, and I made some uh, little plywood chairs. That was part of an exercise. I was teaching a CCAC at the time. It's now CCA. Would you tell us what that stands for? California College of the Arts. 
You've mentioned several times that your partner, Teresa or Terry, has been a muse for you over the years. How has she influenced your work and inspired you? Well, she is a great critic, first of all. She is very appreciative of what I do and what I've done. She's a fan, in other words. She also has a background in architecture herself. She's the granddaughter of an architect. She is the daughter of an architect, a very good one. In fact, her father, George Bissell, is the one who founded the Monterey Design Conference. Nice. In the 1970s. So we have a connection that is just uh, deep in a lot of ways. And she has been a, a writer and critic for some time. Yes. She was the architecture editor at Architectural Digest for a number of years. And she has a background in architectural journalism, design writing. And Terry was with Arts and Architecture in the early days when it was reconstituted. And their office was in the Schindler House, the King's Road House. Sure. So Terry has a long experience with design journalism. And how long have you two been together? Over 20 years. Oh, nice. More recently, Jim, you've been honored as one of the architecture record record houses. Tell us about that house. Well, that house is in Pebble Beach, and my client has owned the property for several years. They were looking for a house that they could have as a family house. They have three grown children. One was in college at the time. Two were in high school at the time that we started it. And they found the right property in Pebble Beach, and uh, we set about it. My client is a developer, and they constructed the building themselves. And describe the house for us so we can try to put it in our brains. The house is a linear house. It's a linear site. It's three stories, but one of the floors is underground because of the uh, FAR, the, the physical constriction on the site. So it's a linear building, three levels. The bottom level being underground is slightly wider than the levels up above. So the gap between what's above and what's below creates a linear slot that allows natural light to flood the downstairs. There is a stair that connects all levels, one stair. It's in a square space. Essentially, the stair wraps around what is a little glass tower, a translucent glass tower that extends up to form a guardrail at the top. There's a skylight up above that space, that stairway space, which allows natural light to reach all the way down into the what would be a basement. The building is very simple. It's all clad in stone, but it is a flat stone of two different varieties. It's all very neutral and warm grays. It's a very, very simple, minimal kind of approach. I assume, Jim, that it's bigger than 750 square feet. How big is this house? It's about 6,700 square feet. So take my little house and add about 6,000 square feet to it. You've got it. Yeah, yeah. I, I figured it was much larger. And still one bedroom, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very big bedroom, Tom. I guess so. <laughs> you can also see this house at Jim's website, jimjenningsarchitecture.com. Jim, you have been involved with so many amazing houses. I just click on one section of your website after another, and you certainly know what you're doing here. You've really mastered this. I wanted to know about one particular house that got you some fame. That was the Visiting Artist House. Can you tell me about that? Sure. The Visiting Artist House was designed for Steve and Nancy Oliver at the Oliver Ranch, which is a property they have in Geyserville, where they commission site-specific sculpture. The house was designed as a guest house for them around 1990, and it sat on the shelf for about 10 years. I had also designed a house for them in San Francisco. It's another one that's on my website. It's the uh, Telegraph Hill house. They sold that house. Steve called me one day and he said, uh, I have good news and bad news. 
The bad news is we're going to sell Lombard Street. The good news is we're going to go ahead and build a guest Wait a house. second. Wait a second. That- Lombard Street as in the famous Lombard Street? Yeah. The one that, that curves around every place. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. This is right below. This is on Telegraph Hill. It's right below. The crookedest street well, in the, the world. The crookedest street in the world is across the valley. If you go down the crookedest street in the world and cross oh. Columbus Avenue, oh, you're okay. driving up toward, toward yeah. Coit Tower. Because that's only one block of a much longer street. That's right. That's right. This building is right below Coit Tower. Okay. So this was designed, the visiting artist house was designed as a guest house for the ranch. And it sat on the shelf for 10 years. Then when Steve contacted me to say that they were going to sell Lombard Street and they were going to build a guest house, there was an artist that they had been interested in commissioning for many years. And I knew about this because Steve had loaned me books on his work and so forth. His name is David Rabinowich. He's a sculptor who had a studio in New York. David Rabinowich had a type of work that he did that involved carving in plaster. All of those pieces were in Europe except for one that was installed in his studio in New York. So Steve, my client, said, go to New York, meet him, and if you guys hit it off, let's see if maybe he could incorporate something into the walls of the visiting artist's house, only if you're okay with it. So I went to New York. I met David. We did hit it off. He absolutely vibrated to the whole concept of the building, the spatial concepts that were involved, and it became a collaboration. So that turned into the carving and into the walls of the house. It involved a lot of sampling of concrete because we did not want to carve into plaster the way David had typically done with his work. We wanted to carve directly into the concrete. Steve Oliver has a construction company, Oliver and Company. They do a lot of concrete work. They built the project themselves. Steve did a lot of sampling of concrete and a lot of sampling of carving in the concrete with local stone carvers, monument carvers. There was a whole crew of people that spent months carving into the walls. And there were something like 600 drawings that were done over the course of the engagement with the artists that are in Oliver's collection of art. What the Olivers have done with their property is to commission art and commission three-dimensional art on their property. It's about 100 acres in Geyserville, near Geyserville. And it essentially creates a relationship with the artists and the art. And Steve Oliver was the chair of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art board for a number of years. And one of the things that Steve thought about the art world in the 80s, particularly the late 80s, that it had become a market, the art market. And that aspect of it and speculation that went on and so forth turned him off. And he decided that what they were going to do with the ranch was to create work that had no value. They would commission the work of artists, and they have major artists there, Martin Purrier, Richard Serra, lots of artists, major art, and it has no value because they can't sell it. It can't be relocated. It can't go anywhere. It's fixed. It's in that location. And the artists were required to go to the property to spend time there and make a proposal and make a specific proposal about what they would do and where they would do it. So, in a way, what my part of it was, in a sense, to create an armature for the art and for the artist. However, the building itself exists as a serious work of architecture and simultaneously as a serious work of art. Because if you look up David Rabinowich and study his work, It is very dependent on architectural situations. Not all of it, but much of it is. And the works that he was noted for, that Steve Oliver was attracted to, the Tyndale works, were works that were embedded in architectural situations. Most of them were in Europe, Germany, and France, but they were contained within existing buildings, and they had relationships across hallways and 
uh, different spaces that created connections. So this was a takeoff point for him. He did not recreate the Tyndale works in the Visiting Artist Project. It's something totally, totally different. But it was a system that he invented because of the architectural ideas that are contained within the building. So it was a response to rather than just a application. Jim, is this a place that the public can visit, assuming you know we start visiting places again, or is it closed to the public? It's not closed to the public. You have to make a reservation to go. It's the OliverRanchFoundation.org. It's a nonprofit that will be available to the public in the future, but you have to sign up to go. Okay. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy today, and it's been such a pleasure to chat with you. Well, it's been wonderful to chat with you, too. I've been talking with Jim Jennings of jimjenningsarchitecture.com, and that little desert house that we talked about earlier is unfortunately not available. It's not for sale. It's not for rent. You can't Airbnb it, but you can look at it on the Jim Jennings website and hopefully appreciate it as much as I do. U.S. Modernist Radio has been sponsored by Modernist Realtor, Angela Roll. In our continuing world of make-believe, Modernist Realtor Angela Roll is being raised on a secluded modernist island in the Amazon, populated only by immortal warrior women with impeccable taste. That's redundant. <laughs> when architect Le Cabousier crashes his plane into this paradise, Princess Diana is too busy teaching a soul cycle class, and she sends Angela to deal with the French bespectacled architect. Le Cabousier, after ranting in French about how Americans have no style, encourages Angela to leave the all-female sanctuary to enter the cynical world of gabled roofs and men for the first time. Men, 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 Ever men, since, men, men. on a mission to defend modernism, Angela deftly deals with unreasonable sellers, unrealistic buyers, incompetent builders, and slow bureaucrats. While hoping to unlock the potential superpower of modernism the world has yet to fully appreciate, modernist realtor Angela Roll is your superheroine. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L. Or call her at 919-995-0550. And now, a few minutes with architect Frank Harmon, reading from his book, Native Places. The first house I designed in North Carolina was a summer house on the Outer Banks for the Wainwright family. I drove there every month for almost a year during its construction. I grew very fond of the little towns and farmhouses that I passed on the way. This is one of them. Mrs. Daughtry. I drove by her house 10 miles east of Trenton, North Carolina, every month on my way to the coast. She grew yellow flowers outside the front porch in a little square garden next to a swept yard. Chickens pecked for bugs under the house. Mrs. Daughtry was sitting on her porch snapping string beans when I stopped to introduce myself. She was comfortable living alone, she said. I've made do without electricity for 38 years and without a car. I got along plain. Her son lived in Florida. I noticed that she restored her clothes. Her dress was darned together like the boards in her chicken house. That was 30 years ago. Now my memories are of yellow flowers along the roadside, growing dark. That morning, Mrs. Daughtry gave me a mason jar of tomatoes she had recently put up. Then I left her to be on time for a contractor's meeting. To me, time was money to be exchanged for clothes and cars. For her, time was life. Driving home to Raleigh that night, I saw an oil lamp in her window, shining in the dark. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by... Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for modernist houses, and by Nichiha.com slash US modernist. 
Okay, Tom, wrap us up. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 significant modernist houses, and access 2.8 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Carrie Chessarino researches guests while juggling two children, a bowling ball, a chainsaw, and also salsa dancing with husband Adam. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another U.S. Modernist Radio. 